Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. Matt Traxler, professor of psychology at UC Davis. And we're talking about his book, Introduction to Psycholinguistics, Understanding Language Science. Uh, Dr. Traxler, wonderful to have you on today. Matt, yep. wonderful to have you on today. And uh, tell us a little, what is psycholinguistics to kind of orient our audience? Uh, that, great, great opening question. So psycholinguistics is a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary effort. Um, at its core, we're really trying to understand how humans produce language and how humans understand language and how, starting from zero, children are able to acquire languages without any kind of special training or, or intervention. And there's, there's different perspectives on those core questions. I'm a psychologist um, train, trained at University of Minnesota, um, uh, got my PhD at University of Oregon. So I'm coming at it from a cognitive psychology, cognitive science background. We're interested in information processing and representations of information and how the mind manipulates those things in pursuit of some task. I spend a lot of time talking to linguists. They have a different orientation. They're, um, they're also interested in cognition and psychology, but they, they focus, if, you know, this could be an overgeneralization, but they focus more on formal descriptions of languages. What, what are the components of languages? How do those things fit together? How do different kinds of languages express meaning? Um, we talk a lot to philosophers. We have an interdisciplinary cognitive science program here where uh, philosophers actually spearheaded that effort. Uh, so we're interested in what philosophers have to say about language. Computer scientists are involved, um, developmental specialists. There, there's a variety of disciplines that um, computer science, can't, can't forget computer science. Uh, but at the core of it is just how that we have this unique ability as humans to communicate using language. Why is that? What are the cognitive structures and processes that are involved? Um, how can we use computer science methods to um, answer interesting questions about human language? Um, so that's, that's it at, at its core. And I, I think of the, the overall effort, psycholinguistics is a piece of it. Um, so using psychological techniques and perspectives to understand language. But language science, I think, is a is a term that I prefer, even though my publisher doesn't, because I think language scientists helps bring together people from different perspectives without saying you have to be interested in the cycle part of it. You can just be interested in language. Uh, great answer. Thank you. Um, and you'll notice, I, you know, this is more of a philosophy podcast. That's how it's categorized because they make you choose a category. Yep. But I, I really do emphasize the big questions side because more and more there is this emphasis, and I think it's the right one, to be interdisciplinary and that these perspectives are not necessarily antithetical. They're things that work together, right? And 100%. that's what a lot... Yes. And so um, can you talk a little bit about um, what it's like navigating... Um, maybe you just go all in on one, one approach, but it doesn't sound like that. Uh, kind of the uh, empirical side of things and the more... Uh, philosophical slash maybe theoretical side of things, um, if that makes sense. So if I, uh, if I understand the question right, it's sort of what, how, how do we tackle these questions about language? And what, what is the connection between the data collection side and kind of the theory building side? And that's, that's a long conversation in and of itself. But one, one of the things that I've observed in my 30 or so years um, doing the work is the the methods have shifted quite a bit, and so um, when I started out, there there was very little neuroscience 
in uh, in in the psycholinguistics field. We we just we had ERPs. They were pretty well developed, but not as developed as they are currently. That's brain brainwave measurements, electrophysiology. Um, Thank you. Yep. Um, b- but neural imaging really was was in its bare infancy. It was very difficult to get access to equipment. There weren't very many sites. Uh, back then, we were using positron emission tomography, using radioactive tracers. And again, the, the availability of, of that research method was very, very limited. And then we started to get the magnetic resonance imaging revolution underway. So now, you know, in, in the last... 10, 15 years or so, there's been an acceleration of using neuroimaging methods to study language. One of my very good friends, Evelina Fedorenko from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has done some great work mapping out, she calls it the brain network. Not everyone agrees with her about exactly which parts of brain participate in language, but she's using very sophisticated neuroimaging methods that I could not have used at, at, in, in the 1990s when I was in graduate school. So that, in terms of methodology, there's been lots of exciting developments in terms of techniques we can use. We can image the living brain. We can assess the electrical activity of living brains much better than we could before. So that's a very, very active area of research. In terms of how, how that ties to theory, there, again, it's a very diverse field and there are people who focus um, on large questions and uh, people who focus more narrowly on specific aspects of language function. Uh, but but I'm, I've always kind of been a follower of Karl Popper. In, in cognitive psychology and psycholinguistics, we can't directly observe many of the mental events that we think are interesting or important in how we produce language and how we understand language. So we're trying to we're trying to look at stuff that's invisible effectively. So we have to be very careful in our theorizing to do Popperian science, right? So Karl Popper said uh, among other things, your your theories have to be able to make specific predictions about future observations. And that, I think, is the secret sauce that unlocks a lot of cognition. So um, if all of the important stuff is invisible, you can sometimes persuade yourself that thing, things are happening um, even though they're not. And if, you're, if your theorizing is loose, and you're not making real specific predictions, and if you're not rigorous in you know, statistics is a, is a big area of conversation now, the way we analyze our data statistically has huge implications on the conclusions we draw. Anyway, long story short, um, the connections between the theory and the observations are super, super important, and there's a real... Um, there's a real push in the field to be more rigorous in terms of how we draw those connections. And that has impacts on how we, how we um, construct our samples. It impacts how we do our statistical analyses. And I think it helps Im- improve the quality of our conclusions because there is, there is a strong push in the field for more rigor. Um, and that, that shows up in, on different dimensions. Uh, and I might be speaking out of turn here, so feel free. One, thank you for taking my question and making it better. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that, Matt. Um, but the, uh, I, I might be speaking out of turn here, but, uh, from the little that uh, reading that I've done in, um, psychology, one of the reasons that Freud has become unpopular is because his theories are not falsifiable, Correct. right? Yep. It's like, uh, when he predicts stuff, what happens is he just reinterprets the event as either one way or the other. And no matter what, his interpretations cover everything. Right. Um, and so, but it's, it's no use as a predictive model, right? And so that's kind of, that'd be a good example Absolutely. of what you're not looking for. Exactly. So the, the classic example, or one of the classic examples is, is the concept of denial. So there's a very famous case from, from Brewer called the Rat Man. The rat man had terrible anxiety, you know, verging on panic attacks. He had this repeated um, 
nightmare, a night terror. He would wake up in a cold sweat because he thought rats were tunneling in, into his body, kind of like that scene at the end of 1984 by George Orwell. So they did Freudian psychodynamic analysis on this fellow for an extended period of time. They discovered to their satisfaction what his hidden conflicts were. And then they did the big psychodynamic reveal. Hey, buddy, here's the source, the ultimate source, the hidden conflict in your unconscious is whatever it was. Hey, you should feel much better now. The guy continued to have all these nightmares. His problems were in no way solved by the psychodynamic efforts. And instead of going back to the theory and saying, well, we did the recipe, we followed what we were supposed to do according to the theory, it didn't work. A, a real rigorous scientist would then say, okay, what's wrong with my theory? And go back and revise. Freud doesn't make that move. Freud says it's the patient's fault. The patient is in <laughs> denial. So if the patient gets better, that's good for the theory. If the patient doesn't get better, that's good for the theory because he's in denial. It's a game of heads I win, tails you lose. And that's, that's what we're trying to avoid. We face similar challenges as cognitive psychologists because, again, not dissimilar to Freud. We are, we are giving explanatory power to things we can't see. So we have to be very careful in our, what, what the Mike Tannenhaus used to call our linking hypotheses. Something invisible is happening. What are the concrete, predictable, objective events you're going to observe as the basis of that hidden activity? And you, you can't just, if your observations don't turn out as predicted, you shouldn't be coming up with these excuses. You have to be going back to the theory saying, well, I guess I was wrong about those hidden, invisible events. Let me come up with a better framework, better theory generate some new hypotheses from that theory that are specific and testable, and then go make the observations. That's what we're trying to do as cognitive scientists and as psycholinguists, because -linguist, psycho again, we're talking about memory systems, attention systems, information processing flow, representations of language components that we can't see. So we got to be careful. And sometimes we have to be humble. Like, okay, I have this theory of how sentences are processed and understood. I I did some experiments. They didn't work out the way I planned. I have to be humble and go back to the theory and say, oops, let me, let me see if I can come up with a better concept. And something I've noticed with social sciences versus something like physics, and this has been a reoccurring problem, is that, and, and some of this has come up in physics, that the observer changes the event, right? But especially especially in in social and human sciences yep. uh, you have to be very careful about the observer changing the event 100% right and how do you guard against that sort of thing we we have some advantages that are not available in some aspects of social science so what you're talking about is what we call demand characteristics and if somebody knows they're being observed they may very well change their behavior there's very famous examples of this from industrial organizational psychology like the Hawthorne effect. This dude back in the 50s went into factories and he was interested in productivity and the factors that would make workers produce more with given inputs. He announced this study ahead of time and then he started playing <laughs> with things like lighting levels and sound. He did all kinds of manipulations to the factory. No matter what he did, productivity went up. He, there was one version of the experiment where he turned the lights down to almost zero. Like you could barely see what was in front of your face. And it didn't matter. People in the factory produced more stuff anyway because they knew they were being watched. So that's called the Hawthorne effect. And it's something we worry about as cognitive psychologists and social science in, in general. We have some advantages in, in the language science field because and again, it's not that we have to pay zero attention to demand characteristics. We still worry about it. But the events, the mental events that we're looking at happen over really short time scales, you know, 100, 150 milliseconds, one-tenth of one second. So we don't have to worry as much about whether people are consciously trying to change their response. Like there's brainwave patterns that are going to happen whether you want them to happen or not. 
So those, those kinds of mental events, we, we really don't have to worry about the demand characteristics too much. Um, we, we do in many psycholinguistic experiments have to worry about special strategies. Um, if, because for example, in reading research, there are different modes of reading that we can decide to engage in. We can decide to really, really um, pay close attention and really read very, very carefully, and that will produce a given pattern of eye movements during reading. It will produce a certain comprehension outcomes. Or we can decide to just skim through things and just kind of pick up a few words here and there and, and get the gist. Those two modes of reading have very different consequences for what we observe when we ask people to read stuff. And a lot of the work in my lab and other people's labs really involves people reading things. We measure their eye movements. And we look at patterns of eye movements to try to figure out what's happening in terms of cognitive processes. And yes, if, if we um, instruct our subjects in certain ways or our participants in certain ways, that could impact their response. And that may influence the conclusions we can draw or the inferences we draw from, from what we observe. So yeah, we're lucky in a sense that things happen so fast and so automatically in a lot of language processes that we don't have to worry as much about participant strategies or demand characteristics. But we sometimes we do. And sometimes we're not aware of what strategic characteristics or strategic processing considerations might, how, how those might influence people's responses. Yeah. Um, and, and so kind of, you know, we've gone pretty far down the path mm -hmm. and I, I want to make sure. <laughs> um, what uh, what is a good definition for you? Working definition. I'm not expecting something that answers every problem because I know this is the kind of thing that, especially from a philosophical standpoint, people argue about all the time. Uh, what's a good working definition for language? Ooh, um, you know, it's no funny. pressure. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were we were having a meeting the other day, just a couple months ago. We have a language group that meets here, and and we review. Uh, study, studies that people have run and, and we talk about different aspects of language and um, one of our faculty members was talking in detail about different different subcomponents of language and how they how they might influence one another in a given processing environment and I'm sitting there and I was thinking we don't really know what language is um, we have formal descriptions of components of language, like there's there's a phonetic features in speech, and those go into making phonemes, and phonemes go into making syllables and morphemes and words, and we can combine those things into bigger units like phrases and clauses and sentences, and then people can have dialogues and discourse, and and all. You know, so at a kind of one one level, there's there's general consensus about what components of language are in terms of the, the linguistic pieces and there's a there's a hierarchy there's more fundamental basic pieces and then you put those little language atoms together and you get language molecules and you put the molecules together and you get compounds and you build you build build your way up on the on the complexity tree um, at a deep, deep philosophical level, I'm not 100% sure that we're describing the right components or whether, whether the way we view those components is, a, is kind of a byproduct of our specific way of observing and thinking about things. That's, that's a very deep philosophical question. There's another really interesting area of research that's it's more or less comparative um, communication research. And, and one of the fundamental questions that those folks are asking is what is language and how does the human language system and its abilities, how does that differ from other animal communication systems? There's um, various ideas about this. So Pinker, Steve Pinker, beautiful writer, very prominent theoretician in language. Um, Pinker and folks uh, like Ray Jackendoff from Tufts University, they, they will argue that there are a few core components of language, and they include things like um, grammars. And there's a special property of human language grammars that differs from other communication systems, and that's this notion of recursion. So Pinker and Jackendoff argue that being able to place a representation inside another representation of the same type 
that the, the mental operation of recursion, that that is um, the core component of language that differentiates it from other communication systems that are shared with our near relatives, other primates. Um, and, and then there's other folks who say, well, no, it's, it's more than just recursion, and it's definitely not grammar per se. So if you go to um, animal communication systems like um, uh, Diana monkeys or rhesus macaques, um, animals that have been taught to use gesture to communicate, there's a grammar that, that those animals follow. It's not as systematic or uniform as human language grammars are, but there, it's a grammar. There are certain components that appear in certain orders according to grammatical rules. And, and again, it's not 100% systematic. If you go back to Nim Chimpsky, who was one of the first um, uh, chimps, primates, that was taught how to use gesture to communicate, Nim will produce gestures in some sequences more often than he will produce gestures in a different sequence. So that suggests that there's an underlying rule that is governing those behaviors. Right? That's why some sequences are more frequent than others. Uh, but that is nothing like the systematicity that you would see even in a three-year-old child. So there's grammars, we think, that govern primate gestural communication. I am reasonable, well, I'm not even reasonably confident. I'm 100% <laughs> certain. I'm not even going to be diplomatic to my friends who do primate communication research. Um, <laughs> it's not the same thing. And um, the, the, the human language system is more complex and it's far more systematic. And it, it, it develops without concrete rewards. And we don't, we, there's a little bit of research from Sue Savage Rumbaugh's lab on bonobos um, showing that bonobos can pick up gestural communication systems by observation, similar to the way um, human children pick up human languages, again, by observation, without explicit instruction, without reward. Or, or punishment, but the degree of systematicity that those um, very wonderful and complex primates, the, the, the systematicity that they exhibit is just not on the same order as what humans do. So I'm convinced as a cognitive scientist, they're both communication systems. One of them is a true language, one, one is not. And, and the precise details of what makes a human language different from an animal grammar-driven communication system, that is a topic of open philosophical discussion. And the discussion focuses around what, what are the grammars look like. What, one of the ideas is, is the, um, the animal communication system grammars don't have recursion. They have sequencing, but they don't have the ability to put units of a given type within other units of the same type. Um, can you give a concrete example of recursion? So tail recursion is real easy. So if I say Tom likes beans, that's a complete sentence in and of itself. I can crack that thing open and, and drop another idea, a sentence-sized idea inside it. So Tom likes beans, that's a sentence. I can crack it open and I can say, PJ thinks. Tom likes beans. So Tom likes beans is now tail recursioned into the bigger unit. And I can do this to infinite depth. So I can say, Matt knows that PJ thinks that Dave believes that Sue remembered that Tom um, reviewed blah, 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 to, to infinite depth. So infinite recursion. Um, there are center embedded structures. And in humans, we think because of working memory limitations, you can only really embed to two levels before things get really hairy. Um, my good friend Ted Gibson at MIT has studied this for years and years. Uh, but a center embedded structure could be something like the rat that the cat chased hid under the porch. That's, that's a double embedding. So you have a center embedded structure within the bigger structure. When you try to go the, to three levels, it gets really difficult to process and understand really quickly. So the rat, the cat, 
the horse bit chased died is a perfectly grammatical sentence. It's almost unparsable for, for real human beings, even if you're super, super fluent in English. So recursion is a thing we have, and in linguistic theory, we can embed to infinite depth. There is no limit. There's no upper limit to the amount of embeddings or recursion we can have. In practical terms, center embeddings are really, really difficult after you get beyond about two layers. Tail recursion is a little bit easier, but why, why would you ever need a you know, tail, tail recursion with 20 embeddings? Yeah, I, the interesting, it's uh, similar to the idea that most people understand the concept of infinity, but we can't actually think yep. infinite things, right? It, like, yeah. uh, if you actually think about like, um, it's like looking in the mirror and it uh, that's facing another mirror and you see what looks like infinite U's. Uh -huh. But uh, when you're thinking about like, I think that I'm thinking that I'm thinking, you really can only hold about five to eight of those yep. before your brain is just like, that's enough for your time to go to bed, you know? 100%. So we, we have hypothetically this infinite recursion ability, which we don't exercise. And one of the live cognitive science questions or psycholinguistic questions is why is that? And so a lot of people are interested in working memory limitations. So there's people who study working memory who aren't really terribly interested in language. There's people who study language who aren't terribly interested in working memory. And then there's people who like to bring those two aspects of cognition together. And it's useful in explaining things like, okay, you have these, these triple embeddings. They do occur naturally. They're not, they're, it's not an extinct species. Um, but they're rare, and when we run into them, they tend to be difficult to deal with. Why is that? Well, there's a whole line of working memory research that specifies here's, here's the system in which language is processed. That's a whole set of cognitive theory, um, and, and that can be useful, and we can test that in various ways. There's, um, there, there's lots of people who've done working memory studies where they measure different people will perform differently on working memory tests. So you test their working memory, you put them in a language processing environment, and then sometimes we observe differences in language processing and comprehension outcomes based on people's working memory capacities. Yeah, I mean, and I think we, we know that at a fundamental level too, it's obvious that some people have better memories than others and are a little quicker to catch on to things, mm -hmm. right? That's yep. like a, yep. a basic test of intelligence. Um, uh, one, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing now that I'm thinking about it. I have been working for a while now through The Language Animal by Charles Taylor. Okay. So when you talk about that philosophical problem mm -hmm. <laughs> about are we looking at the lang problem of language even like through the correct lens, yep. um, that comes to mind. But it's yep. probably good that I haven't finished it because that would probably hijack the interview. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't read it, uh, so, but I'm going to go. I, I better go get a copy. Well, it, it's uh, basically this idea of like, do we build from the ground up or do we think about it as a world? Like, is there a qualitative leap? Right. Oh, yeah. And I, I okay. think even yep. as you're talking there, mm -hmm. which it, yeah. is kind of the core of that question that you're. you're yep. And I don't know the answer because I haven't gotten to the end it, of the book. Well, of PJ, no, nobody knows the answer. And if somebody tells you they do. Right. They're they're not giving you the straight story. There's again, right, right. There's a the, there's an evolutionary psychology branch, and there's there's a piece of that that's in in language science. Um, you know, Derek Bickerton, folks like that, and we have some living language models that I think may be may help illustrate what happened over evolutionary time as we went from pre-human communication systems to Homo sapiens. And the available evidence suggests that Homo sapiens emerged before language did by maybe 100, 150,000 years. There was some weird event um, about 75,000 years ago that there was this cultural revolution. And there are lots of serious philosophers of language and evolutionary psychologists who think that those two things somehow went together. That the... Um, and who knows, was it the the ability to control fire? Was that the key ingredient? Was there some random mutation in some population somewhere probably in Africa um, that created this quantum leap in computing power? So all of a sudden we go from rudimentary pigeon-like communication systems to full-blown, fully modern human language ability. Um, nobody knows for sure how that rolled out. 
there are some very interesting clues in the um, in the in the the record of bones um, suggesting that there were some some changes in in Homo sapiens versus pre-runner species in terms of the nerve tracts that innervate our articulatory systems. Anyway, it's a fascinating area of study. I don't like I review it a little bit because I talk about it from time to time. But it's not certainly not my my core area of expertise. Um, but there's some super super interesting hypotheses, and it is very interesting to think about um, whether a modern language could emerge just by sort of baby steps from some previous communication system, or was there this quantum leap? Um, and the folks who who kind of correlate the language change with the the cultural change based on the the um, the digs the ar uh, archaeological record um, you know there's the case you can make for a quantum leap right because there's there's was it just coincidental or did something really important cognitively happen about fifty to seventy five thousand years ago. Yeah, and that kind of uh, everything we've been talking about was really interesting to me because we're talking about the simplicity of the grammar with um, on the other side of this, either a quantum leap or this, you know, gigantic progression that's happened. Um, and that kind of leads. I, I did not expect in your book so much work on uh, kind of language disorders. Yep. And uh, one of the things that stuck out to me, even as you've been talking here, is um, I want to yep. developmental uh, language disorder. Yes. Am I saying it correctly? Developmental language disorder. Um, this idea of like not like children not catching on to the grammar. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like there'd be a link there. Um, you know, I have five kids, so, uh -huh. you know, maybe I shouldn't call them monkeys, but, you know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, it feels sure. like a way. Um, but uh, can, you t can you speak to that a little bit? So developmental language disorder is, it's an area of um, inquiry back in the day when I was an undergraduate, it would have been called selective language impairment or SLI. And the idea was we have individuals whose cognitive systems are perfectly intact. So their general intellectual functioning, their social function, everything is okay, except for this one area of function language. So specific language impairment. And, you know, there's years of research that went into trying to figure out why some children do not master the adult grammar the way 90, 95% of children do, just without any special intervention of any kind. Um, there's been a change in the way the condition is described and the cognitive theories that go into explaining how and why it happens. So one one of the so you you if you've read about language, you probably read a little bit about universal grammar and the notion. That, Chomsky was maybe in my notes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So every like Chomsky is like that dude. He's dialed in on a lot of things. Um, huge figure in the cognitive revolution. All respect to Professor Chomsky. Um, Anyway, there's a there's been a lot of theory that's that's come out of the Chomskyan tradition that's based on universal grammar, and if we have a universal grammar that's based on a genetically inherited language learning device, why is it in that framework that some children are not acquiring language in the same way that other children are, given the same kind of exposure? And one of the obvious potential suspects is, well, maybe there's a genetic difference. So there are children out there, they, they, they have, uh, make systematic errors in the way they produce certain kinds of sentences involving certain grammatical components. Um, past tense forms of verbs are, are suspect. Uh, possessives versus plural s is a, is a suspect. You know, there are certain little aspects of grammar that these children don't appear to master. And following from the Chomskyan tradition, there's, there's this notion of an extended optional infinitive period. And infinitives are a component of a, of a grammar. Uh, infinitive forms of verbs are a specific kind of, specific, specific flavor of verb uh, 
and it's it's those infinitive components that children with developmental language disorder seem to struggle with. Um, so, so why is that? Well, if you are a believer in universal grammar and a language learning device, you might think that, well, this 7% or so of children who are showing that pattern, maybe there's some genetic component that differs between those children and children who are typically developing. And then about I don't know, 20, 25 years ago or so, this fella Gopnik over in the UK published papers about this KE family. And the KE family had a pretty clear pattern of transmission. So there was grandparents, parents, and children. Some members of that family had the um, characteristic signs of specific language impairment or DLD, development, developmental language disorder. Other members of that family did not have that pattern. They were typically developing with regards to language. Then somebody went in, did some DNA testing, and found that, hey, there's this Fox P2 gene, and there's this allele that is different in the affected members of that KE family compared to the typically developing members. Everybody lost their minds, and, and you got papers in the <laughs> New York it. Times. We got the language gene. Here it is. Boom, we're done. <laughs> um, and, and then as this is the beauty of science, something splashy happens and people go, well, is that really how things work? Let's think up some alternatives and maybe test those out. So people came along following up on the study. And, and now, as I understand, the consensus view is um, there are families that have similar patterns of transmission of DLD to the original KE family, but the way the Fox P2 alleles play out in those families is different. So the KE family might actually be an outlier with regards to um, the, the relationship between presence versus absence of different Fox P2 alleles and the presence versus absence of, of DLD. Um, and also, guess what, folks? There is no language gene. We got zillions of these things. The, the brain is a very complex right. instrument. It's the function and the integrity and the quality of the brain does not, especially with regards to language, does not boil down to a specific allele on one specific gene. It just life is not that simple, even though sometimes we wish it was. Um, so, um, there have been further studies of FOXP2. We don't think it's a language gene. We might think that, um, or again, I'm not, I'm not a geneticist. I'm not an expert on this. I read a little bit about the work because I find it interesting. And my understanding of the genetics work is that um, FOXP2, if it does have some specific effects, is, it's probably um, having specific effects on motor control and motor sequencing. And obviously motor control and motor sequencing is a super important set of functions relating to speech production. So that, that if, if FOXP2 really is specific, it might be specific at, in that area of function, not specific to can you learn the past tense forms of particular verbs or are you stuck using infinitives? Just to draw it out for our audience, uh, from what I've understood as people have come out, oh, it's this gene that does things. You know, I think they mentioned there was like a God gene a couple <laughs> decades ago. Something oh. kind of, you know, it's like, this is the genes responsible for us thinking there's a God. Um, oh. it, uh, they looked at the genetics. It's not that there's one gene responsible for like specific things. It's how the genes generally interact together. Right. That's generally how these systems arise. Right. And we also apparently have to worry about epigenetics, which is how our experience and our own activity can flip on versus off different genes. Um, when I used to work out more, um, yeah, there were genes that were getting activated by that activity. There, I didn't get a new set of genes. I just epigenetically flipped some things on that hadn't previously been, been flipped on. So th again, there, there's a, there's people who are very interested in um, how genetics contributes to neural systems, both the morphology, the physical structure, and the way those, those systems are connected, connectivity. And I think the ultimate answer to the ultimate question of language, how, how, how and why do we have the language abilities that we have, that ab the answer will absolutely will have to reference, you know, 
Human brains are different than other kinds of animal brains. That's a function of genetics. Um, so that's a piece of the answer. We have brains that do language in ways that other animal brains don't. Okay, w what are the genetic contributions to those differences? But the idea that, um, you know, even if you believe that language is innate, and a lot of people do, or language ability is innate, even if you believe there's a genetically programmed language acquisition device, you still don't have to believe in a language gene. Um, you can believe in complex interactions between different genes, and you can believe in different interactions between experience and the activation versus deactivation of genes. And the current state of play is, I don't think we have a very good grasp of that as a field. And that's an area where maybe some smart young people will come along and they'll figure things out better than we've been able to to this point. But they'll always be building on who came before, right? That's like, that's the easy thing to be like, oh, I can't believe they saw that and the people before didn't. And it's like, oh, it's a journey all yeah, together, again, right? <laughs> so like one, one of my favorite philosophers of science and psychology is this fellow called Keith Stanovich, who was a reading researcher down at University of Texas back in the day. And he wrote a book that's been updated many times since I read it called How to Think Straight About Psychology. And he brings in aspects of Popperian um, philosophy of science. He also spends a lot of time talking about how does science progress? We have this idea as kind of casual observers that science proceeds because of these huge revolutions, that there's this one sole operator in a lab somewhere and the light bulb comes on and that person does the the crucial experiment and they go, Eureka, I have found it. Uh, science doesn't work like that. So science, 99.9% .9 of the time, proceeds because of incremental change and, and it doesn't come out of a vacuum. Occasionally you get, and Popper talks about this, Stanovich talks about this, you do get paradigm shifts as new developments take place, oftentimes in technology, but sometimes just in terms of theoretical perspective. There's been a series of those in psychology. We started with philosophy, Wundt established his lab and said, let's not just be armchair people, let's go look at stuff. That's the conversion of the discipline as a whole from a philosophy to something that's more like a science. And then um, we did armchair introspection as our mode of observation for decades in psychology, and people finally said that just because some old dude sitting in his armchair in Leipzig has this thought about his own mental experience, that's not that interesting. That's not decisive. So the behaviorists <laughs> came along and they said, this needs to stop. We can't have these invisible ghosts in our heads and think that those are going to explain stuff. So instead, let's just focus on the concrete. Let's just look at contexts, responses, and consequences. And again, for about 30, 40 years, that's all every, anybody did, especially in America. Rat labs got built all over the place. Pigeon labs got built everywhere. And then people like our good friend Noam Chomsky came along, along with guys like Coslin in the 1950s, and, they, and Al Bandura in the 60s, various people looked at what the behaviors were saying in detail, and they said, this works for, you know, why does an animal learn to do a new trick? Or how can we uh, create environments that will make children act better in schools? But it doesn't explain how language works. That was Chomsky's contribution. It doesn't explain how children learn from just observing models. That was Al Bandura's contribution. So again, about 1956 or so, there was a paradigm shift. We had the cognitive revolution, and, and off we go. And now we've had a neuroscience revolution, where now we can look in the brain, and we can assess our cognitive processing theories by looking at brain activity. That's, that's been a paradigm shift. But it's typically, it's incremental. We do one little experiment at a time. We answer pretty narrowly crafted questions. And when we add all that stuff over time, yeah, we might know some things better now than we did. 20 years ago. Um, so we have these kind of, you know, you, even in your textbook, we build up from um, kind of the origins of speech, speech reduction, to words, to sentences, 
do discourse and then you start talking about metaphors and dialogue when you talk about these um probably what we would fit in that that further end of the this uh human form of language right things like metaphor yep. things like yep. dialogue mm -hmm. um can you talk a little bit um uh, especially dialogue and i've already learned so much so one thank you but I, i'm gonna walk down the stairs here and my wife's gonna ask me what i learned and i don't think she wants to hear me <laughs> recap this for 20 minutes okay so how do you do you say is it grecian how do you say the maxims h paul grice so I, I pronounce Grice. it Gricean maxims from the Stanford Gricean maxims. philosopher of language, H. Paul Grice. See, that's perfect. Because then my wife's like, what'd you learn? I'm like, I learned how to say Gricean. That's like, that's a, <laughs> a very nice, concise. But what are Gricean maxims? And how does that help us understand dialogue? So, so Grice was this philosopher of, of language. And he was interested in explaining why people behave the way they behave when they're interacting with one another in conversation. So I think about Grice's concepts as sort of an ideal, an idealized version of a dialogue. And so he, he starts out with the notion that we cooperate with one another to exchange information. So why do you talk to anybody? Grice says it's because you have some information that you want me to share. And so we're going to en engage in a cooperative um, activity such that the contents of your mind can be transferred and now I have new contents in my mind. So the, the cooperative principle is the bedrock where Grice starts. So we're not just randomly interacting. Both of us have the same objective. We want to share information and we are going to cooperate to make that happen. So the cooperativeness principle and, and, and so information exchange is the objective. Cooperation is the high level means of that exchange. And then in detail, how, how do we cooperate? What are the, what are the, uh, what are the ingredients that go into that cooperation recipe? And he has a whole list of them. Like there's a bunch of Gricean principles. There's the maximum of quality. So when we are cooperating in an information exchange, I should be telling you the truth not lying to you about stuff, not making things up. That's maximum of quality. Um, there's the maximum of quantity, which as professors, we violate all the time. <laughs> I, I should be saying just as much as I need to so you can understand what I'm trying to communicate, and then I should stop. I shouldn't just keep going and repeating the same thing. Over, you get the idea. Um, yes. there's, the, there's the maxim of relation. If we are talking about a given subject, like language, I should stay on topic. We should, I should continue to make my contributions relevant to that topic. Or I should say, hey, PJ, this language stuff, uh, let's, you know, let's change gears and maybe talk about the, the drought. Right? So manner of relation. There's, there's a bunch of other uh, Gricean maxims. And... To a first approximation, they do a decent job of explaining why we do some things in, in dialogue and not other things. Um, but what folks like um, uh, uh, Herb Clark and, and his students, St again, Stanford University um, faculty member, when we look at how people actually operate in dialogue, we are frequent violators of Gricean maxims, and there's oftentimes good reasons for that. Um, so Grice, again, more in kind of the philosophy, how should this stuff work? What are the necessary components to a, um, a conversational exchange of information? And it's accurate in, in, in that sense. We do cooperate when we communicate. We absolutely do to a greater or lesser extent. Um, keep our expressions true. Um, we, we do, to a greater or lesser extent, provide just enough signal so that the intended message can be received. But we do a lot more than that in dialogue. So um, Herb Clark did some wonderful studies on back channel communication, which Grice just doesn't worry about. So when we're face to face or when we're across the Zoom box, 
Um, I'm talking, I'm simultaneously monitoring you for signals that you've understood. As a listener, you are sort of doing the metacognition, monitoring how well you think you're following along, and you will be providing me with feedback that either says, hey, stop, I got it, or wait a minute, that, that wasn't clear, can you please elaborate, or okay, I got it, now let me make my contribution. Um, so Grice is an interesting cat. We still teach him. He's still relevant, but he needs to be understood in, in the greater context. And the contribution is, yeah, this is a great description of formal properties of dialogue. Uh, but when we actually go and look at how people interact in conversational tasks, we violate Grice maxims all the time. And somehow the system as a whole does what it needs to do. I, I will say, as you were talking, uh, the limits on recursion that we talked about earlier were starting to kick in as you were talking about. <laughs> I was sitting here, I was like, okay, my brain's starting to work in overdrive because we're talking about me giving you signals that I'm understanding what you're talking about, about what we're talking about. <laughs> and those, those signals really do have an impact. So Grice yes. was really only concerned about the verbal channel. And the verbal channel obviously is super, super critical to dialogue and conversation. But we're social creatures. We pick up on all kinds of signals that are not verbal, nonverbal communication, facial expression, gestures, mm -hmm noises that are not described classically as a component of language, unless you're interested in back channel communication or things like disfluencies. So, yeah, there's lots going on. Um, Grice is a cool dude but he didn't have the whole picture. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's those little, you know, advances that, that we make together. Yeah. Um, even as you were talking about it, one of the uh, concepts you talked about earlier that one of the, not fully distinguishing, you mentioned something about bonobos doing the same thing, yeah. but that human beings language uh, exceeds mere rewards and punishments. And one of the things that, as you're talking about the Gricean maxims, is they seem to be focused on those rewards and punishments. And there's a lot, as you're talking about, you know, the quantitative statements. And it's like, why do we keep talking when we're not accomplishing anything? And there is like, uh -huh. it's like, there's no reward or punishment uh -huh. here. There's something else going on. Um, I just so much want to get my point across. And I'm so, <laughs> I'm so insensitive to, you know, the fact that you're bored or you, you want to, you know, talk about something else. I just want to talk about what I want to talk about. So that's egocentrism <laughs> is a factor that people study in, in both yeah. language production in how, how we talk to one another. And it also matters in terms of how we understand language in detailed ways that are very interesting. And if you like that stuff, you got to read work by Mike Tannenhaus and his students um, and, and other folks. Well, Juan, let me say thank you for coming on the show. I want to be respectful of your time. And we didn't even begin to scratch the surface on your book. I mean, this is an introduction to a, a, a wide and varied field, but it's been absolutely fascinating. If you could leave our audience with one thing to think about uh, for language, for even how they use language, what would that be? It's, it's this beautiful and complex system. And despite, like, if, if you talk to computational people, if you talk to people who do neurobiology, we look at the brain, we look at the computations that have to take place. It's super, super complex. It is a, it's a massive, difficult information processing problem, both in terms of producing speech and language and understanding speech and language. Nonetheless, subjectively, it is super, super easy. So if, you're, if your audience is going to walk away with one idea, it might be this one. You are really, really skilled at language. And you are super, super skilled at language, even though you didn't have to have formal instruction on how to do it. And that's a testament to the power and complexity and beauty of the cognitive systems that underlie language. So again, it's not like we have a real, you know, knock down, drag out, perfect working description of that system, but we absolutely do understand it does this amazing complex task for us and it feels almost effortless most of the time. What a beautiful note to end on. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming on today. It's a pleasure, PJ. It's good to meet you and th thank you for inviting me on the, on the podcast. This has been a lot of fun. 